I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Bryce Hubner. He's the Provost Distinguished Associate Professor of Philosophy at Georgetown University, where he conducts research connecting philosophy of mind, cognitive science, biology, and moral psychology, among other things. Bryce, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to chatting. Me as well. So it seems like you have a pretty eclectic background in philosophy, because most philosophers are like, I don't know, sitting in their chair reading philosophy and writing. And you seem to be, you've worked in, in various psychology labs and like done some more empirical stuff as well, right? Yeah, I, I would say that that hasn't been the central focus of my work, but I've des definitely done collaborative stuff with people in psychology, with people in neuroscience, um, with people doing more behavioral stuff. So all over that sort of space. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's fair to say that what I'm always trying to do is to find ways to ask and answer questions that are both philosophically informed and empirically well-grounded. Mm -hmm. So what, what are some examples of those big philosophical questions that we, we can maybe start broad and then narrow in? I mean, I started my career doing a lot of stuff more directly on moral psychology mm -hmm. and thinking about the ways that people make moral judgments. And that stuff was more firmly anchored to the approaches in psychology. Mm -hmm. And in that context, I thought that really one of the things that folks had gotten off on the wrong track on was trying to figure out what moral life looks like when you are just sort of sitting back and reflecting on your own intuitions, mm -hmm. which is what philosophers tend to do. And at that point, early on in my career, in the um, early part of the century, um, there was just a movement afoot where a lot of people were trying to ask those questions in ways that were drawing on neuroscience, drawing on law, drawing on psychology. And I really wanted to be right in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably the easiest example. Um, over on the other end of things, I spend a lot of time thinking about questions about how, for example, the wet parts of neuroscience interact with the parts that are more computationally oriented. Mm -hmm. So I've been spending a lot of time in recent years doing collaborations with people on allostatic regulation and all of the sort of chemical what is, structures. What is that? What is allostatic regulation? Yeah, so there's a lot of ways of thinking about it, but um, homeostatus is the preservation of the same. Mm -hmm. Allostasis is the preservation of stability through change. And the basic thought is that in a lot of cases, that's going to be anticipatory regulation. In a lot of cases, it's going to involve lots of complex trade-offs that are anchored to history and anchored to past experience. And it's sort of trying to get a sense of what it is that drives embodied coping with challenges and opportunities. And that, I would say, is the core of where a lot of my recent re uh, research has been focusing. Mm -hmm. And what that means is I've been spending a lot of time with folks who are thinking about things like sodium regulation, potassium regulation, complex trade-offs between um, different kinds of chemical systems and different kinds of neural systems, and also doing collaborative work with folks who are working on um, neurotransmitters, um, working on hormones, all mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff. Because I think part of what I'm trying to ask now is how do we think about cognition in a way that takes seriously the fact that we are animals? Uh -huh. um, and not just in an abstract way, but in the deeply material way that we're constantly trying to navigate challenges figure out where there are opportunities and trying to thrive and flourish where we can do so. Mm -hmm. So does this connect to what you said about moral psychology and that we're not just these like rational floating brains, but we have emotions, we have 
hormones and, and all of these various drives that might influence us away from doing the purely ethical or purely rational thing? I think that part of what ha has happened over the course of my career is I've thought more and more about two issues that get in the way of idealized models of that sort, um, the treatise is just rational agents. One is the high degree of individual differences that show up as the result of history, as the result of past trauma, as the result of past strategies for navigating challenges and opportunities, and as the result of differences in ongoing regulatory strategies. So that's one half of it. The other half is I tried to think about all of the ways that our history um, and the way that our body has coped with past experience ends up shaping and organizing the way that we encounter uh, different kinds of situations and the way that we make sense of them. And a lot of that requires understanding not just facts about our learning history, but facts about the way that we carry our history through different kinds of internalized regulatory strategies. Mm -hmm. So that's going to give you some of those kinds of um, deeply affective or emotional structures. It's going to give you differences in the way that people perceive phenomena, differences in the way that they attend to phenomena, and differences in the ways that different kinds of challenges and opportunities show up to people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we need if we want to make sense of any of the big philosophical questions about mind, whether we're talking about what it is to know the world that we're embedded in, or whether we're talking about what it is to figure out how to navigate the world in an ethically reasonable fashion. Mm -hmm. Do you incorporate evolutionary theory into your work as well? I do. And one of the things that I struggle a lot with and this is a question I've spent lots of time thinking about, is how to make sense of the parts of cognition that are more fragile and sensitive to differences in learning environments and the bits that are more resilient across learning situations. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the really difficult questions that shows up in philosophy as well as the cognitive sciences is how to integrate the recognition that critters of all sorts, animals of all sorts, figure out how to navigate unexpected challenges and figure out how to find unexpected opportunities. And they've got to be flexible enough to be able to do that. But at the same time, if you don't have an anchoring to something like an evolutionary history, and something like patterns of stability, so many of those patterns of learning are just impossible to get off the ground. Mm -hmm. So I did, a, I did a podcast a while ago with a clinical neuropsychologist, Eric Nook, and one of the things we were talking about is resiliency. And the way it's usually framed, <clears throat> it just sounds like resilient is always good. So I asked him, is there any uh, downside to increased resiliency or upside to decreased resiliency? And uh, he was saying that a different way you could phrase it rather than being less resilient is being more flexible, more plastic. So the idea is that if you are one of those more plastic people in a, a very harsh environment, you're going to fare well, fare less well than the person who's resilient. But also if you're in a very enriching environment, then you might fare better than the person who's resilient, more resilient, but also more static. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that that feels right to me. And I think there's one little issue that's worth flagging here, the way that I was using fragility and resilience was to pick out stabilities across environments. Mm -hmm. So um, what, what I want to sort of highlight is that there are some kinds of capacities that no matter what kind of learning environment you drop a person or another animal into, those will be the starting points that they have to work from. There are a lot more of them that develop in an ongoing way through the strategies that an uh, animal or a person um, 
uses to navigate the challenges that they happen to encounter. I think that's a little bit different than the way that you're using the notion of resilience there. And I think that probably at that level of explanation, what I too want to recognize is that the best strategy for navigating a particular space will always depend on your ability to rapidly trade off between entrenched strategies for navigating a space and more flexible strategies for exploring that space. Mm -hmm. And what's going to work best will depend pretty heavily on what the structure of that environment is. And it'll depend pretty heavily on what sorts of trade-offs you can make given your past experience and your history. Mm -hmm. So for these individual differences, they're probably largely comprised of what differences in environment. So that would be the nature or the, the nurture side. If we hold that constant, are there also these sort of innate biological differences that might make two people or animals respond differently to the same type of like learning stimulus? So, so a couple of things. I, I don't think that individual differences are always going to be best understood in terms of learning histories. Mm -hmm. Some of them are going to be just deeply biological facts about how an organism has developed. So you're going to get all sorts of differences in the availability and uh, use and ability to use different kinds of hormones and uh, uh, peptides to modulate your ongoing activity. You're going to get all sorts of situations where early patterns of engagement shape the kinds of strategies you can figure out how to use later in life. Mm -hmm. um, and whether it's right to sort of treat those as all a matter of nurture or not, I think is a difficult question that I'm not sure what to say about. Mm -hmm. On the nature side, I think there are absolutely plenty of contexts where facts about the kind of organism that an animal is will shape the kinds of strategies that it can deploy. Um, that goes all the way from, you know, really simple things like the kinds of food preferences that an animal will have, the ability to learn from the chemical signals of conspecifics in order to decide which foods are edible, um, mm -hmm. all the way up to the kinds of facts that make it possible for humans to acquire and learn a language, um, which are also facts about the kinds of beings that we are and facts that are tied to something hard to know what about our evolutionary history. Mm -hmm. So some of the biological things you mentioned earlier, it sounds like when you're looking at these hormonal or neurochemical cues, you were talking more cellular level. Um, what brings you down to that level of analysis? I'm kind of surprised that you're not looking at it from a more behavioral perspective. Um, like, you know, you pump something full of testosterone and it gets more aggressive or oxytocin, it's more caring and the, without knowing any of the neurochemical details. Yeah, I mean, I think that one thing that is always important to keep in mind is that the stories that we tell about what human cognition and experience are like have to be ones that are sensitive to facts about the experiences of individual people, but also sensitive to facts about their um, neural architecture and facts about what's going on at that cellular level. Those are all facts that are impacting ongoing coping strategies and ongoing behaviors. Mm -hmm. So when we start looking closely, I think, at some of the chemical signaling systems, one of the things that starts to get clear is the degree of flexibility that's present across all sorts of different kinds of capacities. And the way that really simple shifts in the availability of particular um, uh, neuromodulators or the availability of particular hormones can change the way that particular kinds of neural circuits operate. Mm -hmm. And when we start to get a better sense of that, we start to really, I think, 
make more sense of what the on the fly coping of an organism looks like given the rapid changes that often happen in our environments and given the ways that we've got to be sensitive to so many different factors that are happening at once. Uh -huh. So we need something, just one more little point on that. We need a story that can explain the kinds of stabilities that unfold over multiple timescales, some of them lasting for um, less than a second, some of them lasting for minutes, some of them lasting for hours, some of them lasting for weeks, some of them lasting for lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that last question was almost a prodroma for asking you whether you're a functionalist in the philosophy of mind sense, because it's like, uh, that, is it is it more important to understand the details of the process, or is it more important to understand that there is a process that leads to some behavior or like cognitive outcome that we can understand? Yeah, that that's a hard one. I um, recently finished a book for the Cambridge Elements in the Philosophy of Mind series, where I went back and forth with the editor because the editor wanted me to take a stand on whether I conceive of myself as a functionalist. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is, in some sense, probably. And I we think, should define that for, for our listeners, yeah, formally so, define what we mean by functionalism. Let, let me try and do that as I answer. Um, so the sense that I think I am a functionalist in is that I think we can specify what processes do by reference to the kinds of tasks that they carry out. So we spell out what is going on in particular kinds of neural circuits and particular kinds of, of complex systems by reference to what they do, not by what reference to what they are. When philosophers talk about functionalism, they're often operating at a much higher level of analysis um, in terms of uh, states like beliefs, desires, hopes, wishes, dreams, and ways of specifying them in terms of what they do and their functional relations to one another. I think I get pretty skeptical around a lot of that talk. And I think part of the reason is that most importantly, when we're understanding biological cognition, I think we want to understand how an organism, how an animal copes with the unexpected contingencies that show up in its world. And that requires lots of trade-offs across lots of different systems, which are sensitive to lots of different demands and lots of different patterns of structural and chemical organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me know if I'm summarizing this right. So the functionalist would say, we look at the brain and it does X, Y, Z, and it leads to some, let's say, emotion. And they conclude from that that it's it's not the X, Y, Z that matters per se. It's this process of bringing about that emotion. And hypothetically, instead of X, Y, Z, a computer could do A, B, C and get the same outcome. And as long as they're performing the same function, it's the same thing. And the person who's skeptical about that would say, no, maybe not, because maybe XYZ is particular to the, the limitations or the needs of an organism that has a brain that's built this specific way, and we couldn't just map that onto a computer. Yeah, th that seems totally fair. And I guess the one thing that I want to be careful about is I don't want to say that there's anything that a brain does that we couldn't build a computer that did. Maybe we can, but in most cases, that's not really what we're trying to do. Um, in most cases, we're trying to solve particular kinds of problems that we find interesting using diverse kinds of computational systems. And when we're trying to figure out how an animal copes with its world, I think we're just doing something that is a little bit different than that. Mm -hmm. So what I always want to highlight in my recent work is that a plausible explanation of behavior is always going to have to explain how an animal navigates actual and potential threats while managing fluctuations in different kinds of metabolic demands and how they do so in ways that are flexible enough 
to allow them to take advantage of the diverse opportunities that they might encounter. Mm -hmm. And as we start thinking about that, I think the stories just get way more interesting and way more complex. Um, do you do any research or writing on the topic of artificial intelligence? I don't. Um, that's not something that I've ever spent a whole lot of time sort of working on or thinking about. Are you comfortable speculating about it? Uh, uh, maybe. I'll, I'll, because I'm thinking there's a connection here. The connection is the, the, the dream for AI, right, is that we can like recreate human consciousness and we get some sort of super intelligent being that, that's not only really intelligent, but it's it looks like us in some way. But then it's like, like you mentioned, we have all of these sort of innate biological drives. Like we get hungry. Do we want the AI to get hungry? And if it's physically incapable of experiencing that, then is it really human? So that that's where I'm seeing the connection between these two lines of thought. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that I think has to be probably a starting point if you want an AI that is more animal-like, um, I'll just say animal-like um, rather than human-like, is that it has to care in some sense about getting its batteries recharged. Um, that has to be something that it has to figure out how to prioritize, and it has to be able to be trading off of other kinds of tasks in light of that and worrying about whether um, the uh, charging station it typically uses is going to be working this time or whether it might have to go search for another one. Mm -hmm. um, if you start building robots that have that kind of stuff going on, it starts probably to look way more animal-like, mm -hmm. but it's also just a ridiculous waste of resources to figure out how to build something like that. So mm -hmm. I think it's it's probably something we ought not worry about doing. Yeah, that, that's really strange because it, it would make it more lifelike, but it, it seems very counterintuitive or it, it doesn't seem to fit the bill for what AI is supposed to be like. I don't imagine it worrying about like, where's, <laughs> where's my charge going to come from? But that's what we yeah. do. No, exactly. And I, I mean, if, if you want to just think about a really simple example, think about what it takes to be a California ground squirrel who has to live in a space where they're trading off of diverse social needs with all of their other uh, burrow mates, where they're having to decide when to forage, where to forage, where to build their burrows, where they've got to keep track of a diverse range of aerial predators from raptors to owls, a diverse range of larger mammals that might attack them, including bears, foxes, and coyotes, and various kinds of snakes. And they've got to figure out whether to use evasive or confrontational strategies, and whether when they do that, they're doing something that is going to have negative impacts on the other members of their uh, squirrel community. Like All that stuff has to be going on in some sense constantly. And they have to figure out how to navigate those spaces just to survive and be the kind of thing that a squirrel is. Yeah. That's not the kind of thing we care about when we're trying to figure out how to model different kinds of intelligence and different kinds of cognitive capacities. Mm -hmm. I know there's uh, a famous philosophy of mind paper titled, What is it like to be a bat? Did you write a follow up on what's it like to be a California ground squirrel? No, but I, I do have stuff that's in prep that has a lot of discussion of California ground squirrels just because they're amazing. Um, the amazing fact, this is a bit of a digression, but it's a fun thing, so it's mm -hmm. probably worth mentioning. Um, California ground squirrels, when they encounter a snake engage in this practice called tail flagging, where they wag their tail back and forth pretty rapidly to trigger a response in the snake so that they can test how active and how engaged the snake is, whether they should treat it as a predator. And if it responds slowly enough, they can even engage in attacks on those um, uh, snakes and will often beat the snakes and win them. The super cool thing, that's all background. With rattlesnakes, they include in their tail flagging a ultraviolet signal that only rattlesnakes can see which leads the rattlesnake to rattle its, um, its own rattle. And that wow. allows the squirrel to determine what the snake's body temperature is. 
if the body temperature is low enough, because these squirrels know that rattlesnakes will eat their pups, the squirrels will attack the rattlesnakes and they'll win in their fights with the snakes. Because what they're doing is they're testing the body temperature to make sure that they can move quickly enough that the snake isn't going to be able to attack them. Um, they wow. also have high levels of venom resistance to rattlesnakes. Um, so it's just super badass yeah. and interesting phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, that, that is really cool. And what you just outlined is an incredibly complex set of behaviors in a very small animal that probably has a very small brain. Do we have any idea how conscious or unconscious this type of behavior is? The consciousness question is always a, a stinker um, and one that philosophers say all sorts of um, wild and speculative things about. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll say a wild and speculative thing. My bet is that there's a really significant sense in which consciousness and life are pretty t tightly tied up with one another. Um, and the reason for that is if you're going to be the kind of thing that has to make sense of the world from your own perspective to figure out what the challenges are and what the opportunities are, you've got to be doing something in the or on the order of registering those things and keeping track of them. Mm -hmm. There's probably other kinds of conscious experience that only come online with patterns of higher order monitoring. I mean, what's going on in a, a squirrel that does this? I don't think we really know, but one thing that is super weird about it is they can't see the light that is emitted by their tails. So that's something that is designed only to be responding to the um, rattlesnakes. Mm -hmm. Just as importantly, we know it's somehow under their control because they only do it with rattlesnakes and they don't do it with gopher snakes who don't track those patterns of light. Uh -huh. So they're in some sense registering not only that this is a snake, but that it's a particular kind of snake. Mm -hmm. And by the time you're registering that this is a particular kind of snake, I think you've got to have something that is relatively conscious like. Uh-huh. So we, we kind of have some unconscious, unconscious processes like those, like with pheromones, right? Like you, you see someone and you find them attractive and your, your body releases these, these sort of chemical signals, or maybe you're not even interacting with someone, but you're like, there's, there's a famous psychology experiment um, that has people sniffing shirts. It's women <laughs> sniffing shirts that were sweaty, but the different men and one, one had the sweat of a very stereotypically attractive man and the other maybe an average or not so attractive man and they said the shirts from the attractive man smelled better and they had no no idea who it belonged to or that that they were sweaty shirts but yeah so, so i think we want to be really careful there and this is a place where i think a lot more care is required in the literature on consciousness mm -hmm. The people in those experiences, in, in those experiments, are constantly having conscious experiences throughout the experiment. They're not conscious of a particular stimulus mm -hmm. that drives their behavior. I think that what we want to separate is what it takes to be conscious of a particular feature of your experience and what it is to be conscious. Right. And I think the metacognitive monitoring is doing a lot of work to help organize and structure your consciousness of particular kinds of phenomena. But I find it really difficult to make sense of what it would be to be an animal that's navigating these complex kinds of contingencies, that's paying attention to the taste of various foods, to the presence of the particular kinds of taste uh, uh, characteristics that's tracking particular kinds of threat and attending to things like patterns of coloration and have that not be in any way conscious. Uh -huh. There might be, I mean, who knows what they're conscious of? I think that's a much harder question. And that requires getting really concrete about what 
their uh, perceptual systems are capable of tracking, um, getting really clear about what kinds of perceptual sensitivities they have, et cetera. Uh -huh. But I think as long as that stuff's going on, there's probably something in the vicinity of consciousness there. Right. So here's a hypothesis. Maybe the, the total range of conscious experience you're capable of has something to do with brain size or processing capacity. So in most animals other than humans, I guess all animals other than humans, that would be less than what we can experience. Then the, the, the newer idea is, well, not like I'm originating this, but relative to whatever that total brain processing capacity is, um, how much of your brain processing is devoted to a particular sensory uh, thing, let's say, sensory domain. Like for humans, for example, smell is largely unconscious. So we have these processes like pheromones influencing attraction, and we're not really aware it's happening, but visual cues of attraction, we're very aware of. So it's it's sort of serving the same functional purpose, but one we're more aware of and one isn't. And then with dogs, for example, it might be the opposite, like much more of their brain is devoted to smell. And I don't know what it would be like in rabbits, but maybe you get some similar thing there where it's like, maybe more of their brain is devoted to the motion of this tail wagging, but less so to detecting light. So again, here's a, a, another hypothesis. The hypothesis is when we're asking whether a animal is conscious at all, part of what we want to ask is whether they're experiencing physiological demands and having to figure out how to trade them off against one another. Mm -hmm. The more demands there are, the more trade-offs they have to make, the more conscious they're going to be. Right. Is all of that going to be happening in the brain? Well, probably not, because in a lot of cases, the physiological demands are distributed through brain and body using chemical signaling systems that cross between those spaces and using electrical systems that cross between those spaces. But that whole mess is regulating ongoing behavior and ongoing trade-offs in an ongoing way. Mm -hmm. When we want to ask about whether a critter is responsive to particular kinds of stimuli, Part of what we want to ask is under what conditions do those stimuli, for lack of a better term, intrude into the ongoing process that is happening everywhere else. In us, it takes maybe a little bit more work to boost up smell to the point where smells intrude and project onto our current ongoing experience. But um, we can, in many, many cases, attend more carefully and more directly to all sorts of weird states that are going on in our body, which we're only dimly aware of most of the time. But the second we start paying attention to them, they jump right into salience. And I think that salience question is something that requires something on the order of a background regulatory process going on. And the background regulatory process is the thing that's giving us consciousness the intrusion, what demand is currently most salient, that's giving us what we're conscious of at any particular point in time. Uh -huh. So is, is that the, like the, the body parts are always giving the signals that are more or less unconscious until we develop something like a centralized brain to detect them? Or is it the opposite? Is it saying that the centralized brain is what, uh, what would the opposite of that be? Is what creates the signals perhaps? Let me try and, and come at it in a slightly different way and tell me if this helps. So one of the things that often happens in discussions of consciousness is people focus on, um, for example, visual experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps to get us to think about certain facets of consciousness, but it might not be the best starting point. Maybe starting with things like thirst like hunger and like pain, give us a nicer road into 
thinking about some of the stuff related to consciousness. Um, I've been thinking about this for a while, but um, I've been having conversations with uh, John Kuby, who's a neuroscientist, uh, works largely on hippocampus type stuff, but um, is a philosophical thinker as well. Um, he and I have been talking about this recently. If we think about those kinds of states, what thirst does is not just register an absence of uh, water or a need for those kinds of fluids. It motivates behavior, and it does so in an ongoing way to make sure that you've got the right kind of flow of liquid into your body. What does the need for salt do? Um, it's something that shifts the way that things will taste so that your sensitivity to the um, taste of sodium is upregulated because that's an important thing that needs to be ingested in order to keep your body thriving and flourishing. What happens when you've got a need for potassium? You get that same kind of shift. And I think what we can start to see when we think about these kinds of processes, pain as demanding in some sense that you stop doing what you're doing, Thirst is demanding that you engage in activities to make sure that you get access to water. Sodium hunger, working in a way that demands that you go on a pursuit for salt. All of these kinds of things are in a really rich way causing these phenomena to come to salience and to come to attention so that it'll organize behavior and lead you into the right kind of situation. I think that sort of picture is where we need to start from when we're talking about what consciousness is. Uh -huh. um, we need to start from thinking about why um, we need to be sensitive to the taste of salt, why we need to be sensitive to the tr traumas to our, our bodies that are mm -hmm. registered and structured as demands on our ongoing behavior in the case of pain. Now, at, at the most basic level, you see things similar to that, even in single single cellular organisms, right? Like they they the parts of the cell will be able to detect whether there's like an imbalance of of sodium or potassium or whatever, and then they can move towards areas <clears throat> where there's a more positive or negative charge. So you can yeah. say two things about that, and and both sound kind of crazy. One thing you yep. could say is um, this is evidence that it's like the most basic level of consciousness because it's the same thing we're doing, or you could say like it's purely mechanistic. But then like everything that comes ground up from that is also mechanistic. So then you would just say that humans are basically like brain robots. Um, so I'm actually more sympathetic to the claim that maybe those single cells are have like some very basic level of consciousness. But then it, it gets really complicated from there, as I'm sure you know. Yeah, ab absolutely. And that's why I started off on this little uh, topic saying that I think that consciousness comes along with life. Um, it's, if you're the kind of thing that needs to figure out how to navigate your environment and to do so in ways that are sensitive to challenges and opportunities, mm -hmm. I think you're at least on the edge of uh -huh. being the kind of thing that'll have consciousness. Um, that's speculative. That's wicked yeah. speculative. And I have no idea how to redeem a lot of that, mm -hmm. but I think that when we start thinking about squirrels, which is where we started with this, I think it's really hard to deny that they're conscious in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, is their consciousness like ours? Probably not. I mean, I have right. no idea what it's exactly like to be a squirrel, um, but that's more about the fact that they've got to be sensitive to a very different kind of range of demands on their ongoing behavior mm -hmm. than I do. I agree with you completely. Now, I want to see if this can be extended one step further because it, it seems like the limiting factor here might be life, but what is it that's special about life? Like hypothetically, if, if you're a panpsychist, a panpsychist believes that everything is conscious, how is um, detecting a positive or negative charge that life needs to sustain itself different from like magnetism? Like, couldn't you argue that if there's just matter that isn't living, if it's attracted to some charge, could you say that like a panpsychist, that's a, that's also a form of conscious attraction? I guess somebody can say that and people do say that, but the thing that makes me apprehensive about that claim 
is that it's not clear what kind of benefit and understanding the world comes about from that kind of deposit. When, this is why I, I want to say too that it's, I don't really know what to say about single celled organisms. Mm -hmm. Some of them look like they're making decisions. They look like they're trying to decide how to adjust their behavior in light of what's happening now. And they look like they're sensitive to the trade-offs between um, incre increased pursuit of a resource and the risk of following a particular trajectory. When we get to that perspective, I think it at least opens up interesting possibilities to think of the single-celled organism as actively engaged in trying to figure out the space that it inhabits. And it's that active engagement with the structure of the world that I think is the bit that's really interesting. Uh -huh. um, and it's active engagement that's shaped by a history and shaped by the current demands on self-regulation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then, then the key difference there might be that for life, if life is anti-entropic in the sense that it can expend energy to maintain its form rather than just decay or kind of change as most matter would change, that would be the thing that that might be fundamentally connected to consciousness. I, th I think that's a reasonable place to start. Um, at the end of the day, I'm not going to go too hard on claiming anything about single-celled organisms, but I am going to probably go pretty hard on claiming that squirrels uh -huh. are pretty conscious. Yeah. Um, and that's in part because of the complexity of living the life that a squirrel needs to live. Mm -hmm. Um, or living the life that a person needs to live. To make this even more complicated, I want to ask you about this idea of macro cognition or distributed consciousness. Yeah, yeah so the uh, first book that I wrote was a book on distributed cognition. And it had a way more traditional functionalist take on those kinds of questions. In that book, one of the things that I wanted to focus on was the way the distributed groups of animals are able to integrate information in ways that go beyond what's possible for any of the individuals. That uh, constitutes a group. So if you think about, for example, the kinds of foraging decisions that a uh, school of fish is making, in many cases, the knowledge of the space will be distributed among the members. The knowledge of what is present will be distributed among the members. The knowledge of what available threats there are uh, and opportunities there are will be distributed among the members. But by tracking and responding to the animals that are nearby you, you can pass information between animals that allow you to work collectively and cooperatively in order to solve the kinds of problems that you need to solve. So that was the kind of issue that I was concerned with there. Now this and applies to humans too, right? It, it does. And one of the Actually, two of the things that I ended up saying in that book were, first and foremost, the fact that you're sharing information among a group doesn't necessarily entail that the group gets smarter than the individuals, because sometimes the sharing of information is keyed into a particular kind of task that's relevant to the group. And where that happens, you end up with a cognitive system that is capable of responding to a much more narrow range of contingencies than any of the individuals might be able to respond to. So that's the first point. The second point was, I said in that book, 
it's not at all clear to me that any of these patterns of interaction that sustain coordinated group behavior are sufficient to generate shared consciousness. And at, at that point, I didn't really have much more to say about that. I said roughly that if it turns out that there's a way for uh, consciousness to be spelled out merely in terms of functional organization, there's no reason to rule out groups functioning in a way that yields some kind of higher level consciousness. Mm -hmm. I've gotten more and more skeptical of that claim the more and more I've paid attention to biology. And part of the key reason is that figuring out what it takes for an organism to preserve its structure and its stability requires in a lot of cases thinking about how it's sensitive to particular classes of uh, needs, um, interests, and demands, which aren't going to be the ones that are often showing up at the level of the group. Uh -huh. And in many cases, what becomes way more significant is being able to track where conspecifics are, how conspecifics are moving, and what those conspecifics are pursuing so that you can build your own understanding of what the opportunities and possibilities are. Right. And so, so yeah, I would like to jump off that because maybe it, maybe your goal isn't to sort of navigate in this group optimal way, but just to understand the group so you can figure out what you can do to, to maximize your own gain. Like with the tragedy of the commons, for example, where you have some public good, like let's say the fish in the sea, and you're going to think, I can never out out like overfish the ocean so it doesn't matter if I go and get like tens of thousands of fish for myself because there are far more than tens of thousands but then if everyone thought like that then the ocean would be completely depleted yeah I, I I mean that's right and I think the other side of that which is the side that I think we should always highlight when we highlight the tragedy of the commons is that there are a lot of cases where tragedies of the commons don't emerge Mm -hmm. And those are cases where you have shared buy-in within a community, where you've got shared commitment to particular norms and values, and where you've got shared understandings of the conditions under which somebody should be punished for overusing or for um, not taking part in shared practices. And I think the key thing to notice there is that lots of groups hit on those strategies precisely to mitigate the tragedy of the commons but it requires a much denser degree of integration within patterns of self-understanding mm -hmm. and patterns of shared valuing than you typically find in more distributed groups. So it seems like we're good at that when, when it's like a small group or when we can actually see the changes that individuals are making. So like if you live in a community and there's maybe like a communal food supply in the middle, people can probably tell if you take a larger dent than you should. But if you live in like a giant city or if we're talking about the whole ocean like we just were, then it seems almost impossible to track. So so would you say that the larger um, the group gets, the more likely we are to, to, be, to be susceptible to the tragedy of the commons? I, I wouldn't say that. Um, and I, I would say there are patterns of typical behavior that go in that way. But one of the things that Eleanor Ostrom's work on the non-tragedy of the commons shows is that there are design principles that can function in much larger groups, which are able to sustain much more uh, stable patterns of interaction that don't overexploit the resources that are available to them. Mm -hmm. um, th those design principles have to be ones that people have buy-in for, um, and they have to engage in shared patterns of forward thinking that are tied to it. But the size of the group doesn't necessarily look like it's a limiting factor. Um, it looks like it's just a case where it's a little bit harder, the larger a group gets, to make sure that you can build up those kinds of um, uh, shared understanding and those shared patterns of valuing.
Okay, so if not tragedy of the commons, then what's an example of something where you said that this idea of distributed cognition influenced your thinking of moral psychology or of, or of ethics more generally? I, I don't know that I would say that. Um, I think that for me, a, a lot of those questions are slightly different questions. I started in on that project of thinking about distributed cognition on the assumption that something would fall out of that for understanding um, moral psychology and collective action. I think what I realized is that understanding the conditions under which collective action works to achieve a particular goal doesn't necessarily give you purchase on questions in moral psychology. And part of the reason for that is that you can have moral psychologies that are way more sensitive to those shared patterns of valuation and shared goals. And you can have patterns of moral psychology that are way more sensitive to navigating a situation where there have been entrenched patterns of um, exploitation and exclusion and mm -hmm. um, over extraction, et cetera. And if we want a story about moral psychology, that's a plausible story. It has to be one that's capable of making sense of the different strategies people will employ when they're in a situation that's highly extractive and when they're in a situation that's more cooperative. Mm -hmm. Did you read or hear about a study a few years ago? They were looking at autonomous vehicles um, and and moral judgments. So it was it was basically a series of trolley problems. So it's like, should the car crash and kill its one driver or should it uh, run over like three people crossing the street? You've heard of that? Yep. So there were two interesting findings there for me. One is that uh, lay people's moral beliefs were very different from those of moral philosophers because lay people said, for example, it's better for the car to run over an old person than a young person. And yep. moral philosophers were saying like, we shouldn't take into account any of these uh, characteristics, like a life is a life. And the other thing was that if you asked people about how the cars should be designed, um, mm. they said that it would be better if these cars like prioritized um, killing the fewest number of people possible, even if that mm. meant killing your driver. But then they asked, which of these cars would you buy? And everyone said, there's no way I'm going to buy a car that would prioritize killing me. I would rather my car run over like five other people and kill me. Yeah. I mean, one thing that that gets me thinking about is how much of the literature on moral cognition focuses on judgments and I think those judgment data, both in terms of how things pull away from the philosophical claims, as well as the patterns of differences and judgments that you pointed to, depending on what kind of question you're asking, those are all important factors in making sense of part of our moral psychology. Mm -hmm. But we also want a good sense of the conditions under which people cooperate, the conditions under which people become more altruistic, the conditions under which people engage in mutual aid and mutual support, the conditions under which people are more likely to display compassion towards others. And if we're fleshing out a full story about moral psychology, we've got to move way beyond questions about what kinds of judgments people make to try and figure out how to get people into a situation where they act in ways that they don't end up regretting in retrospect and where they act in ways that help to sustain the viability of the populations and groups that they're a part of or situations in which they're capable of restructuring and reorganizing their world to bring it into line with values that aren't actually present yet. And that's where moral psychology lives. And it's a it's a mess trying to figure out how to get into those spaces. Mm -hmm. The great thing 
or the terrible thing, depending on your perspective about talking to philosophers, is you realize how complicated any single topic is and how complicated it is to study it empirically, uh, way more difficult than we think. Absolutely. Bryce, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, this has been a blast. I had a good time. You thank too. You.